Welcome back guys. Today we're going to build organic LEDs. The advantages of these are that they're potentially cheaper, thinner, lighter, energy efficient, flexible, and can be printed with inkjet printers. But first, let's take a look at inorganic LEDs. They consist of an N and a P type semiconductor. Light is emitted when electrons drop from a high energy state to a lower energy state. This is called the band gap and is engineered into the device by the particular semiconductors and the doping used. Electrons enter from the cathode side in the conduction band, a higher energy state, move towards the holes in the anode, and drop across the band gap and emit a photon. Organic LEDs have similar structures, however, they're made of polymers that are carbon based. They have cathodes and anodes injecting electrons and holes and band gap materials that emit photons. This would be a good time to point out that just because these are organic, it doesn't mean that they're any less toxic than other semiconductor devices. In fact, some of these could be worse. Now let's do a couple band gap experiments. We're going to use photons. Photons have a particular energy depending on their wavelength. At the deepest red of the spectrum that we can see, it's 1.6 electron volts and towards violet it's 3.27 electron volts. Be sure not to confuse brightness of light and the energy in a photon. Brightness is just our perception of more photons. Materials will start to absorb photons near their band gap energy. In other words, it's their absorption edge. For instance, silicon is at 1.12 electron volts, well below the visible spectrum, although infrared light will pass directly through a silicon wafer. Diamond, on the other hand, is well above the visible spectrum, so all light in the visible spectrum will pass right through. Materials with a very high band gap are excellent insulators, and materials with no band gap are conductors, and everything between is a semiconductor. Guys, when your wife or girlfriend complains that you bought her an artificial diamond, just explain to her that cubic zirconia in some instances can have a 6.1 electron volt band gap, which is far superior to diamond. When photons are absorbed, electrons are promoted from the ground state up to higher energy states. And when the electrons drop back down to the ground state, photons can be emitted. If there are intermediate energy states, the re-emitted photon can be shifted to a longer wavelength. In this organic molecule, DPA, it absorbs UV and re-emits blue light. To demonstrate this, I have four vials of liquid with band gaps approximately of 3 volts. When I shine green light on it, which is below 3 volts, we see very little. When I shine violet on it, which is closer to 3 volts, we see fluorescing. Let's look at the electrodes on the device we're going to make. For the cathode, we're going to need a low work function. Work function is the amount of energy it takes to free electrons from the surface. Unfortunately, these metals are some of the more reactive metals on the periodic table. Calcium, magnesium, cesium. The low work function will inject electrons into our semiconducting polymer. For the anode, we'll use a high work function, which is more likely to accept electrons than give electrons. It will be the transparent conductor indium tin oxide on glass. Conduction in polymers is very complex. It's referred to as hopping charge transport. Charges move from molecule to molecule from overlapping pi bonds. Their path is somewhat random due to the irregular overlap of the molecules. I want to thank Polymertronics for letting me sucker them out of all the materials to do this project. I know the eutectic alloy was extremely expensive and I really appreciate it. If you're an educator or you'd like to repeat this experiment, go check out their science kits. The most reliable way to apply these polymers is to spin coat. You can do either a solid or a flexible substrate. I use a CPU fan to do this with double stick tape. For this demo, I'm going to use the conductive glass. I'm going to check for conductivity to make sure I have the correct side. I'm not going to spin coat it. I have plans for the other parts of the conductive glass. These are the three components. P dot, PSS, it's a whole transport layer. The emissive layer, which is the red diamond ruthenium complex. And the cathode, gallium indium eutectic alloy. First I add the whole transport layer to the conductive side of the glass. This will bring holes to the emissive layer. And I let it dry. 
And next I add a couple drops of the ruthenium emissive layer. Metal complexes similar to this are being extensively researched because they not only exhibit fluorescence but phosphorescence. Compounds that only emit photons in a fluorescent mode are only 25% efficient due to the fact that 75% of the electrons flow through the triplet state and are turned to heat. The compound is structured such that it can emit a photon during fluorescent mode and phosphorescent, you can reach quantum efficiencies of 100%. The final step is to add the collector, which is the gallium indium eutectic alloy. This is pretty cool stuff because it's liquid at room temperature. I just applied a little bit to my alligator clip and rubbing it around the emissive layer until the LED started to light up. I tried other work function metals for the cathode and I found that they work too, just not quite as well as the gallium indium. So aluminum, tin lead solder, um, carbon, all of them seem to work a little bit zinc from a penny. I have some fun OLED stuff that you can do with glow sticks, but that's going to have to wait until the next video. Wow, you made it through that video. Congratulations. If there's links, I'll put them right here. If you'd like to contact me and help out in some way, my email is scorched.chips at gmail.com. Look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for watching.